Hi guys, um, welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, first, before I start, I'd like to do a little bit of a survey. Can you guys hear me in the back? Okay, without a mic? All right, cool. That's not the survey, but the survey is how many, uh, how many of you are current product managers? Just show of hands. Okay, a few. How many are kind of aspiring product managers? Okay, that's, wow, okay, cool. About 75, 80% of you. Uh, and then how many people are not in tech right now? All right, a couple, cool. Um, that's, that's good because um, just a little bit of background on how, how I got here. I'm, like Carlos said, I'm a product manager right now at, at uh, DocuSign. Prior to this, I was a product manager at uh, Lyft, and prior to that, I was PM at Amazon. Um, but what, this is a, uh, you might be wondering, why is there a factory here? Uh, so this is actually my first job out of school. Um, I was a mechanical engineering major, um, and uh, right out of school, I, I went and worked for Apple to run factories in China, uh, in supply chain, something totally unrelated to what I'm doing now. Um, and that's actually kind of the course that a lot, a lot of product managers I know take to, to get to PM. Um, there's not really a, I guess, there's not really a product school until now, but uh, even today, there's not really, you can't really major in product management um, as an undergrad. So most PM, PMs I know kind of take a roundabout way to, to get to the, the role. Um, so after, after I, I went to Apple, I went to business school, and then I uh, started at Amazon, and that's how I got here. Um, so I, I frequently get asked a lot of questions, so mostly, you know, what do you do all day? Um, what skills do I need as a PM? And uh, also, what... Uh, what can I do to become a PM? So, uh, given our audience today, it's, I think it's uh, pretty good to, to talk, go into that. Anyone watch Silicon Valley, the show? Yeah, it's good. Uh, that's why you would get this. So, um, this is what my mom thinks I do all day. So, she's basically this is a scrum ma uh, scrum master, kind of managing uh, the the work for for the engineers and figuring out uh, what, what is the next thing. Uh, it's not too far from the truth. So I went back and uh, looked through my calendars and tried to figure out how, how much I spend my time. Uh, as you see here, more than half the time I'm in meetings. Um, and this hasn't changed throughout all the companies I've worked at as, as a PM, uh, nor has it changed for any other PMs I know. Basically, you're meetings all day. Um, I'll talk more about what those meetings are about. Uh, but besides meetings, uh, the next biggest chunk is for research. And that includes you know, talking with customers, talking, uh, looking at the data that you gather from your customers and, and seeing how the users are using your product. Um, that, talk, that, that also includes working with your UX research group, uh, working with your researchers, uh, looking at UX studies, um, basically, uh, and, and then also looking at competitors and see what your competitors are doing. So that's a good chunk of time there. The second most amount of time is uh, spent on project, that actually should say project management, but basically that's um, the, the scrum part of it. So uh, you're in Jira all day. Jira is a, a software you use to manage uh, workflow uh, for engineering. And uh, you, you're, you're kind of there for your engineers, uh, for the engineers on your team to clarify any requirements, uh, any questions they have on your requirements, um, kind of just doing project managing. Uh, the next chunk of time is spent on presentations. This, this varies. Um, depending on what phase uh, you're in, uh, what kind of company you work for, um, and what your product is. So basically, presentations is, you're, as the PM, you're the face of the product. And you're supposed to be the expert of your product. And so anything that goes wrong, people kind of tend to blame you for it. And uh, a lot of this time, you know, you, you're kind of presenting either to your team, to your engineering team, um, what, what, what we're doing, why we're doing it, what are the current results, or you're presenting to the C levels or you know other officers within the company, right? Um, as as a product leader, this is what our group is going to build. Um, and sometimes you present to customers. If you're in the uh, kind of a business to business type of role, you you tend to present to um, your end customers a lot. And then the next uh, chunk of time is in planning, and that's mostly. Um, kind of forward-looking about maybe a quarter or maybe um, a few sprints ahead and planning the work, planning the product roadmap, and trying to figure out what it is that your team will build. And then finally, a little bit of hiring here. It, this really varies depending on what kind of, what, what level of product management you're in. Um, as PMs in sort of smaller companies, you will be called upon to kind of interview other PMs and, and screen resumes and stuff. But the biggest chunk of meetings is here. 
And I find that, um, again, looking through my calendar, it seems that a huge role as a PM is kind of to be the shield for your team. As in, as a product leader, you will get many, many requests from across the company, um, from marketing, from you know, legal, from uh, operations. Uh, everybody will have ideas on what your company should build. And, and everyone will come up to you all the time and say, hey, you know, we have, I just thought of this idea, we should build this, right? And this happens basically multiple times a day. Um, and if you think about it, it, there's never enough time to, to build all the ideas that we have, right? So um, at, as a part of your job description, really, is you want to shield your team from building unnecessary things that you don't think uh, should be a priority for the company. Um, so that's what a lot of those meetings are about. And then the other half is basically about meeting with other, other kind of groups within the company to try to get your um, project map, roadmap done. So most of the projects you build will have dependencies on other teams, right? For example, if you want to launch uh, a new product, you have to work with marketing team to figure out a marketing campaign or write a blog. You might have to work with their brand team to figure out, um, you know, uh, some sort of uh, blog post or, or branding marketing stuff. Um, and then also you have to clear with legal to make sure you're not breaking any laws. You have to clear with security team to make sure you're, you're not exposing you know, personal information from your customers. So a lot of that. Um, throughout the, the, the three companies I worked for, I, I found a few essential skills that, that seems to be a common thread across, um, across the spectrum. So first, you need to speak with data. Uh, second, you need to motiv you you need to come up with a strategy. Um, you need to come up with a strategy, and you need to communicate a strategy, and you need to motivate your team, your engineering team. Uh, I hear a lot that you know people say your PM, you're kind of the CEO of the product. Um, I haven't found that really to be the case because uh, you, as a PM, you can't really direct people what to do. Um, nobody reports to you directly, so it's it's a lot of soft skills that you have to develop to try to coax and um, try to convince, try to motivate people to see things your way in order to build what you want them to build. Um, so motivation is actually uh, a really key key component in, in your effectiveness as a product manager. And lastly, technical communication. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, first, so speak with data. So here's a, here's a quote. Um, in God we trust, all others bring data. Um, I think I find that to be pretty pretty true uh, when I was working at Amazon, because at Amazon, basically, unless you have the data, uh, it's just talk. No one really listens to your opinion unless you can back it up with data. Um, so any, any decision you make, any, any points you try to make, everyone will challenge you and say, Where, where's the data? Um, and there are two types of data. There's quantitative and qualitative. So quantitative data is kind of stuff you can uh, query from your database, as in you can look up how many users are using your product. You know, these are hard numbers. Uh, there's qualitative data, which is a little bit softer. Right? It's kind of uh, the data you get from talking to your customer, the data you get from um, you know, survey results, and just uh, reading what people are talking about your uh, product from online, stuff like that. Um, but sometimes as a PM, you got to be comfortable with um, taking in all the data points and then also making a decision without all of the data you have. So here's an example. Um, this is a product that, that I worked on while I was at Amazon. It's the Amazon Vehicle Garage. So as a user, uh, you, can, you can go on Amazon, you can tell us what, what car you own. Right? This isn't my car, I wish I had a Tesla. But, uh, so once you tell us what car you own, we can then suggest products that you can buy, that you're likely to buy, that other people have bought you know, to try to merchandise to you. At the time that I was there, there were about some, something like 5 million cars in the garage, so there's a huge user base already. Um, so if you look at this, this feature down here, the feature categories list, where we su suggest parts and accessories that you can buy on Amazon, uh, this is a huge amount of um, revenue generation. So one one question was, how should we, how should we order, and how should we, what categories and what products should we, should we merchandise here, right? Um, at the time, Amazon sold. There's hundreds of thousands of different SKUs, right? That different things that we sell. So you know, why, why do we merchandise one versus the other? Um, and me being kind of a car guy, I, I love cars just as a hobby, right? So at first I was like, oh yeah, this is easy. You know, if I had a Tesla, I would totally buy this, this, and that. 
And then of course, somebody challenged me, well, where's the data in that? How do you know people are gonna buy this, right? Of course, I didn't have any data, so okay. Um, so first thing we did was look at the quantitative data. So you can do that at Amazon Buy, just querying the database, and there's hundreds of millions of rows because there's, everybody shops on Amazon, right? Um, and each of these queries takes hours or sometimes a whole day to get back results. So after, after many hours, I got back a result uh, of a sales data by volume. So it seems like it makes, a good, it makes sense for you to, um, or at least for us to merchandise uh, the most sold products, right? The problem is, if you look at what's, what, Amazon, what Amazon sells the most of, it's a lot of bumper stickers, if you just only purely look by volume. So it doesn't make sense if, we just, if all of this stuff is bumper stickers. So then, okay, so what if we look at it by revenue? So after a few more hours, right, we query the, the database again, and it turns out that if you look at it by revenue, it's a bunch of um, very, very expensive things like hydraulic lifts, kind of tools, things that cost, apparently you can buy a hydro, hydraulic lift for $3,000 on Amazon. Um, anyway, so having a lot of automotive tools on here doesn't make sense either, right, if you only go by that data. So then, okay, well, what if we just look at how many views each, each product has, right? What, peop what are people researching? Well, it turns out those are all wiper blades. Uh, people, people buy a lot of wiper blades for their cars. So then it also doesn't make sense for, for us to have 10 different wiper blade ca categories on here. So then we turn to qualitative data. And uh, you know, we interviewed the vendor managers that, that were working there. Um, vendor managers are really the people that own the P&L for the business. So they're the, the guys that go to like Bridgestone and go to different vendors and try to you know, negotiate pricing and try to you know, buy, buy, buy things at a lower price. So they're kind of the business owners. Right? So they understand their portion of the business very well. So for automotive, you know, there's a vendor manager for like trucks, there's a vendor manager for fluids or something like that. So then I went to each of them and said, hey, you know, you know your business well, what are the things that you would put onto this merchandise, um, merchandising page? So then I got a list, several lists of those things. And then we interviewed the internal SMEs. They're subject matter experts. So for example, if you have a Tesla, if you have an electric vehicle, it doesn't make sense for us to show you motor oil as a category, right? Because you don't have an engine that, that, runs, uh, that takes motor oil. Um, or if you have a truck, it doesn't make sense um, for us to, uh, actually, so people that have trucks buy in a totally different behavior than people that have cars, right? If you have a truck, you tend to buy giant lights for off-roading for some reason, and then, and then other types of truck-related uh, accessories. So then we have to kind of separate the, the categories by uh, body type. So anyway, talking with uh, different internal subject matter experts, we got some more qualitative answers in terms of what we should merchandise here. And then, uh, of course, we, we research competitors, what, what are everyone else doing, uh, other automotive online retailers. And then also looked at research papers in terms of how is the uh, automotive uh, space growing, which are the categories that we should uh, go after to, to merchandise more. And at the end of the day, we kind of use, blended all of these sources of data. Uh, we used the quantitative data as a base um, and then kind of tweaked it with the qualitative data we got from all of these different types of data sources, and that's how we came up with this. Um, I'll pause here if there are any questions. Oh, yes? That's a good question. The question was, uh, who is doing the research and uh, when we talk to experts and, and then who, how's the team like, right? So this project actually was me and one other product manager. There's two, two of us. Um, mostly I was focused on this, this area. Actually for this, it was, I, I was the only product manager on it. Um, and then I had help from, from other people just to interview, to do interviews. Um, so you'll find that in a lot of, I shouldn't generalize, but basically in, in most of the, the, the cases, right, um, a product manager will be working on one product, or I should say one product should have one product manager, um, or at least one feature of a product should have one product manager. Um, at least that, that's the, the case I've seen, you know, as, as, that's why as PMs, you know, you have 
quite a bit of leeway in terms of what uh, what gets shipped. You have quite a bit of ownership over your products. Um, Yeah, so the question was, uh, where do you draw the line between intuition and data? Um, that's a good question. So it, it really depends on the, the situation. So in some cases, if you're building uh, an improvement upon a, uh, an existing product, right? So you should have data already over something you've already shipped, right? So you can see what, how people are using your product today in order to maybe use your intuition and then try to verify your intuition with maybe surveys and some sort of qualitative data. Um, in the case of uh, this, or in the case of some brand new product, you don't have any data, right? Because it doesn't exist. So in that case, then you have to look at uh, kind of sideways data. See, maybe if someone else has shipped what you want to ship, or, or something like that in the in, in the space, how are they doing, right? If you're trying to say build an automotive store, which nobody has yet, right? Maybe look at some uh, adjacent types of smaller startups that are trying to go in that space and see how they're doing, how much funding have they gotten, you know, like is this a good area to go into? Um, at, at the end of the day, it's, it's kind of an art. It's not like, you know, here's the data and then you, you just look at the data, right? That's why product management, it's also part art and part science. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, one more question, then we'll move on to the next okay. section. Um, so when you're dealing with qualitative data, how do you know that, like, you've done enough? Because it doesn't really scale the same way like quantitative data can. Right. So when you interviewed the, you know, the vendor manager, he's asking me, like, how did you know that you would interview yeah. yeah, so the question was, how do you know uh, when you've had enough qualitative data? How do, how do you know when to stop getting more qualitative data? It, it's really more of a judgment call. Basically, if you have enough, um, you always start with the quantitative data if you can, if you have any. Um, and then it's, it's more of a judgment call. Basically, if, if you can satisfy everybody around you that that's, nobody's kind of going to challenge and say, hey, I don't agree with this assumption, I think that's where you kind of draw the line, right? Uh, the thing is, it, you want to get something out there, and then you want to collect data as soon as possible. Because you could, you could kind of sit around and try to collect more data until the cows come home. But then, uh, without real data, you know, without real, real product in the in the marketplace, and having collecting actual data, you can't really. It, it's all just kind of educated guesses, right? Um, let me move on and then come back to you after this. Sorry. So the second thing, um, I the second thing I thought was, was kind of important was to you need to communicate your plan um, and motivate with OKRs. I'll explain OKRs in a second, but uh, as part of your responsibility as a product manager, um, it's your job to come up with a strategy and to communicate that strategy and to motivate uh, your your teammates to, to execute against that strategy. If you don't do that, I'm gonna click here real quick. Hopefully this works. You end up like this. So if you like South Park. So that's what happens when you don't uh, have a plan to get there, and you have a, you have a, and you don't have a strategy really. Um, so, as a product manager, you know you need to get everyone to understand your strategy and your roadmap. Uh, you need to motivate your engineering team. The way to do that is the tool that um, that Lyft uses, and also that uh, Google and and LinkedIn and Twitter and many many other uh, Bay Area companies use. It's called OKRs. It stands for Objectives and Key Results. Um, tool to communicate and track results. So OKRs help you answer three, three questions. One, where am I going? Two, where am I? And three, how do I get there? So the first, the first question, where am I going? Um, that's what objectives are. Objectives are kind of business objectives that your company is, that your company is trying to go to. Uh, it's, it's kind of a quarterly goal that you're trying to move um, your team to. 
And to, to get there, key results are the measurable progress, that's kind of the metrics that, that you measure yourself by. And um, combined, you use that to drive your roadmap. So that's how you determine what you're going to build. Um, it sets a direction so everyone will work towards the same, the same uh, goal. And uh, there should be no more than five OKRs. So, there are, so then you're forced to prioritize. Uh, you're, you have to figure out what is important, what are the most important things. And finally, it, it allows you to say no to non-OKR items. So if any random person kind of suggests, hey, we should build this, well, then you can ask, hey, does, does this work towards our goal? Does this t work towards our objectives? Right? If not, then don't build it. So this is an example of an OKR. Uh, this is not real numbers or not an actual OKR, but uh, something like it at Lyft. So say you're part of the driver, driver experience group or, or driver group. Um, and your objective here is to grow the supply, which is the number of drivers, or really number of driver hours. Um, so that's the objective, that's the business goal. And how do you get there? So there's three, three KRs here, three key results. First one is to increase uh, the number of new drivers, right? That's how you get, just get more, more people in. Um, the second is you try to get uh, the grow the conversion rate, so try to get people in even faster. And the third one is you increase the number of rides. Uh, that each driver is, is driving. And each KR needs to uh, line up to a, a specific metric with a number. So from X is uh, what it is today, right? So uh, how many new drivers we have today, to Y is what you hope to be or what you would like it to be at the end of the quarter. Um, and, and these ones are, all the numbers are kind of hooked up to dashboards, and this is shared across the company. So every week, um, you report on how you're doing in terms of these key results. So everyone knows, hey, this is, as a team, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to grow drivers by increasing the number of new drivers, by increasing the sign-up conversion rate, and by uh, increasing the number of rides per driver. Nothing else. This is, this is all we're doing. Once you have this, uh, the roadmap should come from the KRs, right? Each, each roadmap item, each project that you build, needs to line up to at least one of the um, key results. So that's how you know that the project you're, you're building is, is doing something. So for example, the number of new, increasing number of new drivers um, from, from X to Y, I, I couldn't use real numbers here because you know, Lyft is a private company. So, uh, so one thing that you can do that, uh, one thing you can use to increase the number of new drivers to increase the referral program. Right? So they get a lot of uh, new drivers through the driver to driver referral program. So by increasing maybe uh, the f decreasing the friction or increasing um, the, effectiveness, the effectiveness of the referral program, uh, we, can, we can get there. And then another, another thing we can do is compliance. So Lyft operates in many countries in the US, but every, sorry, not many countries, many cities in the US, and every city has their own laws and regulations. Uh, every state has their own laws and regulations. So uh, interesting facts that you know, if you are a Lyft driver in Seattle, you have to have a business license. Uh, also a fire extinguisher, I think. If, you're, if you are a Lyft driver in um, New York, you have to be a professional driver. And if, you're, if you want to drive in, if you want to operate in um, Portland, Oregon, you have to uh, have a certain percentage of your fleet be a wave, a wave which is a wheelchair accessible vehicle. Anyway, so th there's tons of different laws and regulations governing depending on you know where where you operate. So uh, compliance is a is a huge driver of growth because in order for us to operate in some new city, we have to comply with this local laws, which means on the product side we have to build some sort of feature to to comply with that. Um, and then you know increasing driver sign up conversion rate. Uh, you can do that by reducing the friction for the sign-up flow, so reducing the number of steps for someone to sign up. You can also do that by increasing the web, website speed, uh, which we did, so that actually showed a dramatic increase in uh, conversions. And then also finally, you can uh, increase the number of rides that each driver drives by uh, showing them, uh, by improving the driver dashboard, which shows them, hey, how much money they're making right away. Um, so anyway, these are just some examples of projects that can map up to uh, the KRs. So that's how you uh, kind of build a roadmap. I'll pause here. Any questions? Oh, sorry. Uh, do these 
ideas of uh, products come after the OKRs? Or did you already have them before and then you set the OKRs to? Yeah, that's a good question. The question was, uh, do, do you, do you, do you get, what, what figure out the objectives <laughs> first and then the, and then the um, projects? Or do you figure out, hey, I want to build this, so then what is the objective that will fit this thing, right? That's, that's, a, that's a good question. So um, it, it should be, it should be, the, the first time, the, the first way. <laughs> so um, objectives should map up to your company objectives, right? So your, uh, the CEO would say, hey, we're, we're trying to grow drivers and passengers and number of rides and, and this, these other initiatives. And then these objectives for each of the individual teams should map up to the company objectives. Um, and then the, each of the measurable results kind of map to the objectives and then you figure out what you want to build. Um, it, in reality, it's, it's kind of a mixture. Sometimes uh, there will be an idea, say, hey, we want to build this feature, right? But then how can we justify building this feature if it doesn't go towards one of our goals? So then we have to think, yes, well, this feature will do something that touches this goal, and then therefore you can justify it. But I think if it's some random feature, which does happen, like that people just suggest, hey, we should build this, and it doesn't go towards this goal, then, then we just cut the feature, because there's, you know, you can't justify building it. Cool. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, uh, the OKRs is for my team, and then you know, how is my team made up? Or like, what is what is one team, right? So generally, uh, I shouldn't say generally, but any, anyway, in the companies I've worked for, um, there's one PM, and they they have a dedicated development team. So there's, um, I had 14 engineers at Lyft, uh, and then I was the only PM. And then um, I, on average, it's about one to maybe seven ratio or so. Uh, for it varies depending on what you're working on, and then teams get split up all the time. But basically, there's one PM, and then there's like a dedicated uh, product or dedicated engineering team, and that's kind of and, and they drive towards like one of the areas of the company. It's usually how it goes. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. How, the question was, how do you decide the success criteria? Uh, well, so so if you think about um, some some of the KR some could be really broad right some could be you know make more money for the company right or increase um, increase revenue from X to Y. Well, many things affect that KR right. It it may not be because you built a much better website that that's why the um, the the revenue increased right. It could be many many other factors. So you have to choose KRs that um, will be affected. More or less directly by the result of your of your product. So, for example, if you're trying to um, build a feature that that specifically targets one segment of your a customer, for example, for Lyft, say if we try to target, um, I don't know, users that use between midnight and 2 a.m. for some reason, uh, then we want to build a feature, maybe a promotion that pops up in your phone, or maybe an alarm, or some other idea, right, that, that only targets that, that segment, maybe like after the bar is closed, right? Um, and then your, in that case, your KR would be very specific to that, to that, um, that segment. Yeah, so, but more or less, it should kind of, you, you can, you should map to the objective, right? It shouldn't be just some random things that, you know, it, it is affected by your product, but it doesn't map to any objective. Uh, one more question that happened a while, yes. <coughs> Yeah. How, the question was, how do you, uh, how do you decide on the objectives, and how do you decide on what to achieve, right? How to achieve those objectives? Yeah. So the objectives uh, map up to the company objectives. So kind of the CEO says, this is our corporate objectives, and then each of these uh, gets mapped down to the the individual PM. So that's how kind of objectives are are uh, driven, and then uh, the the KRs are. So you can break an objective down into components, right? What do you think will will move that final objective number? So those are, it's it's kind of a negotiation between what you think and then what engineering thinks and then what everyone else thinks, honestly, at the end. Cool. 
Uh, just moving on. So the last one is uh, be technical. By that, I don't mean you need to be a software engineer. You don't need to go to, to school to, to get a degree. Uh, you, but you do need to know how to speak the language or at least know enough to, to be able to talk with your engineers. Um, if you come from a non-technical background like, like me um, or someone who's not in tech, you, know, you should learn from uh, your engineering counterparts, kind of your engineering manager or your other engineers that are on your team. Um, or you can take an intro to programming course. There's tons of them out there. Um, and uh, yeah, you just have to understand enough to talk with engineers. Um, and then you should be able to understand enough about your product, your PM, to uh, be able to explain it to someone who's non-technical. So try explaining it to, say, your, your mom or someone to, who, who's not in tech, right? Um, and, and see if they understand what it is that you're building. Uh, th this, this one's, I, I put it here because I think it's important, um, depending on, no matter where you work as a PM, you should know how exactly your product works. Uh, I, by that, I don't mean just, hey, you click this button and then you see this thing. Uh, you know, you see the next page and then you click this button and then you see the next page. That, that's kind of, as from a user perspective, that's how it works, but also the under, underlying technology, right? Where's the data kept? Where, you know, where, like which, which stack is it on? You know, like how, how's, how does the data move? What is the data model? Um, stuff like that. So, yeah, so I think, to summarize, um, you know, speak with data, communicate the plan and motivate, and uh, be technical. The last slide I put in here is, you know, I get that question a lot. How do I get into product management? Since most people here are kind of aspiring PMs, um, there are a few things you can do. And for me, you know, when I try to get a product management role, this is the advice that was given to me: that you can switch roles or you can switch. Um, industries, but you can't do both at the same time. So, for example, if you're a if you're someone in a software company already, but you're in marketing or you're in design or you're in operations or support or whatever, um, you can you can move into a PM role within your company by kind of networking and seeing what opportunities there are and and some of the other things I'll talk about. Um, but uh, if you're currently say in a hardware industry. And as an engineer, it's very hard to become a PM in a software industry, right? It's, it's, it's much more difficult as a switch. So you should either switch to a software engineer, software engineer first and then try to become a PM or um, go into a PM in your hardware industry first and then switch over to PM. So the second one is try to be helpful to product managers that, that are in your company. Uh, you can kind of offer to help with doing user research, uh, with doing surveys, doing project management to try to help QA the products. Um, PMs are generally overloaded and they, they never have enough time to, because they're in meetings all day, uh, they never have enough time to do real work. So um, helping, helping those guys out will, will definitely, one, uh, allow you to, to uh, get a piece of, a small piece of project, product management and also, you know, create some goodwill and then, um, you know, there, I've seen, I've seen, um, colleagues that move in from support team to become PMs. I've seen people move from marketing to become PMs by, by kind of uh, slowly, gradually moving towards the PM role. And then talk to other PMs about their role to product management because uh, probably over 90% of PMs don't start out as product managers, right? They start out doing whatever they, they used to do and they somehow uh, moved into the role. And then uh, you should network within and outside of your company um, Angelus is a is a good place to go. Um, it's where a lot of small startups actually post jobs and and, um, and and actively look for recruits. And then also LinkedIn. Uh, learn some coding skills. This one is probably the least directly uh, the least thing that you can do that directly affects your ability to get a PM role. But I think um, having coding skills, having technical skills, is is never um, will never hurt you. It's it's always going to be a plus. Um, for your career later on, and then follow the latest technology trends by reading up on books, you know, tech tech news, funding rounds. This is an interesting one. So every time a company gets funding, it's on TechCrunch, and every time they get funding, that means they're trying to expand. That means they usually have heads that they're trying to grow. New departments have you know have maybe a pro actual product management department being being sprung up. Um, so if you look at a company, if you see a company that just got you know, hundred million dollars of funding or something, they're probably gonna have, uh, if you just check their website, they're gonna have a ton of like new openings. 
Uh, and then lastly, don't give up. It's it's really hard to land your very first product management role. Um, for me, it took a long time, but it, but it's a growing industry uh, by the fact that you know we have a product school and there's so many people here. And, and every time I come here, there's like more and more people. Um, you know, the the industry itself is growing. It's really hard to land your first role because generally companies that look for PMs want existing PMs. They want someone with already with PM experience. So to get your very first foot in the door, um, it, it requires all these other things, you know, networking and then trying to help out and trying to move slowly towards that role. Um, so that would be that'd be it. Questions. All right, I saw a, a hand in the back. Sorry, that the way in the back. Yeah. So, uh, question was, what advice would I give a college student who's interested in having a product management role in the future? Uh, there's a few things you can do. So, typically, product management roles come up. Uh, either you start your own company and you're the CEO, and, and usually the CEO is the product person, right? Because they're the only person at the company. Um, or you can go to a, a Google or a Facebook or a huge company that has uh, has an associate PM role, right? And those are roles that take in fresh grads uh, or fresh, yeah, fresh grads straight out of school. Um, so those are those are two of the routes. Or you could go to a business school, which is another kind of typical route. Um, it, the, the thing is, when you're still in, in school, you know, you can try to do a lot of school projects, right? Uh, kind of projects on the side, and then you can try to get noticed that way, and then try to um, uh, do some sort of product management type work while you're uh, as part of your project. Cool. Yes? Um, I don't want to like, speak more, but I think you might have also known, like, if you're down the road, like, what are some good roles to go into that might have been I see. So, so is that right? So, okay. So, the question is, what what are good roles to have um, down the road? As in your first role, like your first role out of college, right? What should you what should you first look for? Okay, cool. In order to get a, a good shot at being a PM, well, I think um, so. Product managers have value by understanding the customer better than anyone else. Really, you should you should really understand the customer. So you could. Um, I, I've seen PMs that go to that get the PM role from either support or engineering uh, a lot. Actually, um, I'd say probably try to try to go into software and development. That's like a CS role, and um, so then you have the technical part covered, and then um, try to develop your business acumen uh, once you're in a in a software role. Yes. Okay, so the question is, if you're, is about if you're, you, you're kind of junior type of role right now. You don't have a lot of experience, but you'd like to move into PM role. But most of the PM roles they they want another PM uh, with uh, with a couple years of experience, right? Um, yeah, that's that's a good question, and that's why I think uh, we have we have this product school. Uh, you should come to product school, and uh, you should you should learn from other other PMs. Um, I think. Again, it's it's always difficult to find your first PM role. Um, the really, you can kind of sell yourself a few ways. You can say, hey, you know, yes, I haven't had that much experience, like that, like you asked for on the on the resume, or um, but I've done these other types of work that has product management elements to it. In oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So I find that it's kind of like a situation where, you know, um, sometimes you work for a PM that has this way more experience than you'll have in your near future. Mm -hmm. And other people are able to get those jobs. Well, I'm kind of wondering how do people get a product management job like 
Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, so the question was, um, if you're already PM, how do you? Why do other people get roles that I guess? <laughs> okay, hang on. I'm, I'm saying this the wrong way, but got it. So I found that on the job description, there are a lot of kind of requirements. Um, they're they're there to filter out the the people that are truly unqualified. Um, but it's not also not a hard requirement. So it's really case by case, right? Maybe I, I can't speak to why some people get a PM role when they, when others don't. But um, sometimes the, you know people interview better. Sometimes they're just really outperforming uh, based on the number of years of experience. Maybe they've, um, if you can try to see if you can get more responsibility for your role, right? Maybe your role as an associate PM, right, is only to do. Um, not so much the strategy stuff, more the tactical, you know, execution, managing engineers type of stuff. Maybe you can try to try to look for a role where you have more of a long-term view, more of um, a, a strategy, a strategic component to it, and then try to kind of go beyond what, what your job calls for. Um, that's what I'd say. Yes. Okay, so uh, from a design perspective, um, really, uh, every every new product you do should be based on the user, right? So it should be um, kind of driven by what the user feedback is and, and what their user wants. Uh, I find that design usually has a lot of good ideas because they they work with the user a lot. They work with the user research group a lot. In fact, our, our user research group is embedded as part of the design group. So um, they, they tend to have a lot of good ideas on um, the user experience, right? So um, a lot of ideas that are generated actually came from design. Um, so design is one of the one of the sources of new ideas of new things to build. For, at least for me, um, when, whenever we say for the next quarter, right? What are we going to build? And then we, what I do is I go and get feedback from all of the different cross-functional groups, right? And say, hey, based off of your experience, based off of where you stand. Um, what do you think we should build? What, or do you have any suggestions that, that, that you know we should consider? Right? And and typically, you know, if you're uh, if you're in product support, you get a lot of customer complaints, so you really hear the voice of the customer. If you're in design, you kind of you, you can really empathize with how um, how the the product looks from a from a user perspective, end user perspective. Um, if you're in marketing, you can kinda, you have a lot of competitive. Um, data, so everybody can add something really different. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So two questions. The first one is uh, what kind of the skills uh, hiring managers look for, or at least, or, or for me, yeah. Um, that one, so typically, uh, kind of the three I mentioned here, but uh, someone who is, um, huh, that's a good question. The skills are generally d dependent on, uh, really, during the interview, you know, you can kind of tease out. One, I try to look for, do they use data? Um, kind of the first thing I mentioned there. So I would ask them a question, for example, hey, here's a very broad question, right? Like, you're trying to increase conversion in this one area, um, how would you go about doing it? And then I would try to look for certain keywords that you should really hit on, like use data, or try to, I would try to look for, um, uh, you know, looking at what the, the users now, what are they doing, try to, try to use data, and then try to talk to um, other experts in the field and, and try to get qualitative data. So that, that's one thing, the ability to, to, to make decisions based on data. Um, another one I would use for is uh, I would look for is you know how do they prioritize among many competing priorities because uh, that's uh, kind of a table stakes for as a as a product manager you always get more asks than you have um, than you have resources for and the way to answer that is go through kind of a process of hey what are the most important things you want to get done as a company. And then what are the what are the metrics you're trying to move? And then that's how you prioritize, right? Or you can start with um, the customer, right? What are the customer pain points, and therefore how does that how does that move towards um, your your matrix, right? 
sorry, the second question was yeah, so, uh, technical, technical got it, programming languages. That, that is really dependent on you. I think what we try to look for is someone who is somewhat technical, um, someone who has had some experience with at least one programming language, um, or you know, at least know the basics of CS101, right? How does a web server work, and like, what is a, you know, st stuff like that. Um, I will try to go this way. Yes? Um, two questions. One, you, you just mentioned that um, someone started from the PM assistant and then became a PM eventually. Um, what's the typical time for that? And then the second question is, um, what's the career path for the PM in the future? Got it. Um, so what's the typical path to go from associate PM to a PM? The, the, the amount of time. Um, that, that depends. I've seen, I've seen people go from you know, a couple years. Um, but that, that really depends on your company and then how you perform. And, and uh, I've seen people that go there for quite a, quite a long time. Um, and then your second question was? Um, what's the future career path for PMs? The future career path for PMs, yes. So product management is you can do many things if you're a PM you can, uh, as far as the next step goes. You can continue to move up uh, within the product organization. So it's typically, um, you know, associate PM, PM, senior PM, director, product, uh, senior director, VP of product, and then CPO, chief product officer. Um, that's, one, that's one ladder. But because a product manager has so many other groups that they interact with, um, you can easily move towards product marketing or marketing. You can easily move towards you know any number of other uh, other fields. So I think it's quite flexible. It, it gives you quite a lot of options. Um, one thing I've noticed in, in the Bay Area is that there's not that many levels of product. Um, it, it, the product org tends to be quite small because if you think about engineering, right, you, you tend to have many engineers to one product manager, right? But think about how big the engineering org is, right? So it's, uh, there, there tends to be not, not a huge product org, right? Because too many, too many chiefs in the kitchen is not good. Too many chefs in the kitchen. Sorry, English is not my first language and I'm not good at this. Um, how are we doing on time, are we good? Okay, cool. Uh, yes, sir, on the back, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, so you went to school, right? Yes. Okay, so the question was, uh, from business school, what elements of business school do I find most useful in, as a product manager? Um, that's a good question. So in business school, really, you, you learn a couple of things. One thing is uh, to look at a problem from many different points of view. So uh, a typical problem could be, hey, if you're the, the like, you know, CEO or whatever, manager of some company, in, you're in this case, what would you do, right? So there's more than one way to solve any problem. So if you look at it at through the, the, maybe the user's lens, hey, the company should do A. If you look at it through a financial lens, the company should do B. If you look at it through a legal lens, maybe you should do C, right? So uh, business school kind of gives you um, perspective on, from, from other views, and that's something they use from, as a product manager because you have to put on many hats and, um, and kind of come at a problem when you try to motivate the, the cross-functional team to do something, you have to think from their perspective. Right? Say, for example, one time, you know, um, one time I wanted to build this project, and uh, it's something it, it's something that I knew was good for the user, but uh, the, my engineering counterpart didn't really agree. Right? He wanted to build this um, very. He wanted to spend time on on some very technical project to uh, to, to advance to to get our tech stack back. To the, to the kind of bleeding edge. Uh, so then it was kind of a discussion to say, okay, well, we have only a certain number of engineering hours, what should we spend it on? Well, you know, from, uh, from a user's perspective, right, we should really build this product. Uh, from a financial perspective, this product makes sense, right? From, um, maybe from an engineering perspective, I get, you know, I get your, your point, point of view, right, that we should work on our tech stack. But um, if we get, you know, I say if, if we build this project that I want to build, then we can move all these other points, and then we can build your thing later. And then, so it, it's a way of, I guess at the end of the day, you know, it, it, it gives you perspective from other people. Um, yeah. Yes. 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 
Yeah. Yeah, so it's a good question. So the question is, uh, if you were in sales before and um, you want to move into product, you're kind of what, what kind of suggestions, right? But I actually have seen people that go from support and sales moving into product. The, the reason is you have a very big advantage, which is that you talk to the customers, and which is not you know, an engineer would say they do, right? Typically on a day-to-day -day basis, and and you're presumably presumably really good with people, right? Good, good with um, talking with customers and know their, their pain points really well. So that is something that is table stakes, like I said, to, for a product manager to, to know, to have the knowledge of, right, in order to um, suggest really relevant and really good um, features to build. So I think I, I think what I would do is try to, you know, help out your the PM that you currently work with. I'm sure, you know, customers all request different features, right? Hey, you guys should build this thing that's only catered to my company, even though I'm one out of a thousand customers you have, right? Um, and uh, because you're working with a product manager, you can you can kind of be the voice of a customer. Um, and and by that uh, by that token, you can kind of like gradually move into product, I'd say. I, I will talk to your, your PM and PM leadership and see if there's any sort of ways you can help out at first. And then like once they see how well you do at being the voice of the customer, then you can take the next step, which is to maybe, you know, be a junior level product manager or something like that. Yeah, I've, I've definitely seen people people do that. Uh, I've seen I've seen them switch no, actually, I haven't seen them switch companies. <laughs> but yeah, because the reason being, you know, like, like I said before, most PM roles um, look for other PMs, people with a product management title on it, right? So really, you just need the first job that has a product management title that does the actual PM work. Then the second role is much easier to come by. Um, yeah. Yes, yes. What quality have I seen in crappy product managers? Um, well, I, I think, again, it goes back to the customer, right? Uh, as, as a PM, you have to talk to a lot of people. Um, you never want to do anything in a vacuum, right? You never want to uh, form a, a strategy or, or write a spec, write a product requirement really in a vacuum. So um, those that, that network a lot outside of the PM role, right, those that talk to all the different uh, different groups within the company <laughs> tend to do very well. Uh, those that kind of stick to themselves and have questions and kind of um, try to figure it out themselves don't do very well as a, as a PM, right? It may be okay as maybe an engineer if you have just like to figure out problems yourself. You can just like, you know, kind of be by yourself and just put headphones on. But as a PM, those, that, that doesn't work. I can take two more questions, it looks like. I'm giving the, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, the question was, what are my favorite PM tools? Um, I think Jira is something that most companies use, so it's it's kind of like um, like your left or right hand, basically. It's your, like an arm. Uh, you cannot get away from Jira, so definitely learn that. Uh, in terms of uh, the data, so Mixpanel, if your company wants to pay for that, or Google Analytics, if it's free, um, those are some of the tools that, that I use a lot uh, because basically I have a dashboard that every morning I come to work, I look at the dashboard. How are, uh, of The dashboard has all of my main metrics for all of my products, right, to, to know how they're doing. Right? Um, so every morning you should get in the habit of looking at data and, and looking at how uh, uh, you know, your, your features are working. Yeah. Sorry, how do you spell J-I-R-A. Yeah, it's a, it's an Atlassian tool, but yeah. Um, yes, last question. Yeah. 
Got two questions. First one is how often do I see product managers actually work on the product as in code, right? Not very often because your your value as a product manager is not the code, right? That's what engineers are there for. Uh, your value as product manager is for you to understand the customer and, and know what needs to be built and then and then among all the other things and then try to draft you to build it. Second question was uh, Data science, yes. It's, is an advanced data science degree necessary? No, it's not because they have, there are data scientists out there that you can leverage. Uh, but yeah, I think that's, if you go to get a, get a data science degree just to be a PM, I think that's uh, kind of not the most efficient uh, time, yeah. Okay, cool.